welcome back everybody um i know it's been a while i'm sorry apologies i just can't keep keep up with my actual work so this has been uh, a long time coming but because i i was um fortunate enough to appear on national television with this particular recipe and it's coming up to christmas and it is a christmas recipe I thought I might as well film how to make this and hopefully you all have enough time to get it done for your own family and, and, and it's helpful. What I'm talking about is Dresdner Stollen or Stritzel as we call it in Dresden and it's one of the most famous Christmas cakes there is. It lays claim to be one of the oldest. It was first mentioned in 1474 so a long long time ago and back in those days this type of baking was made before christmas during a fasting time and so the catholic church decided that it should not contain butter so it was originally made just with wheat flour yeast and water and it was a pretty bland kind of product and the Saxon rulers at the time petitioned the Pope for a record of 40 years. I think it was three successive rulers who petitioned the Pope. And in 1490, he granted them finally what is called the Butter Letter or Butterbrief, allowing the Dresden bakers to use butter in their Christmas cake, in their Stollen. And that letter is still in existence in the Saxon State Archives, so if anybody's interested and um, has a vested interest, so to speak, they can probably go and look it up, I don't know. Um, but that is how long ago this dish was already quite famous. Also, Dresden lays claim to being one of the oldest Christmas markets in the world, um, together with Nuremberg. And that's called the Stritzel Markt. Stritzel being the Saxon Dresden word for this type of cake. And there are a number of reasons why, or, or people think there's a number of reasons why it's called that. But um, one of the reasons is the word Stollen in German is actually a, a mine shaft. Although Stritzel, some people say, is representing, especially being a Christmas cake, representing the baby Jesus in the cradle, you know, the sort of long shape wrapped in linen, that sort of thing, and being white and innocent. So I don't, I don't really know, really, and I don't think anybody really knows for sure, but suffice to say, this particular recipe has been in my family since the 1920s, since my grandmother wrote it down. And there is a copy of the original recipe in her cookbook that is at my parents' place. So it's been in the family since the late 1920s, possibly earlier because she got it from her mother and grandmother. So it's been around. Every family in Dresden, well, maybe not every family, but a lot of families and definitely a lot of bakeries have their own little twist. Um, to this day, this is a protective, protected good in terms of geographical location, just like Champagne, by European world law. So a Dresdner Stollen can only be made with, like, either within Dresden and surrounding areas. And there is only 110 certified bakeries within that area who are allowed to make this and sell it as such. And they get a, a special seal that they have to put on every single one and they're numbered. And so it, it is quite a special thing. Yes, there are other types of Stollen. Of course, there are in, in, in German other bakeries, but the Dresden one is arguably the most famous and back in the day when my family started making these or well they didn't start them but when i first remembered it that was behind the iron curtain so we would collect some of the ingredients all year 
especially the raisins and the lemon peel and orange peel and the rum. Um, sometimes you soak the raisins and rum overnight. I'm not doing this for this time around, but normally you do. And and then usually around about September, we book a time in the local bakery and other families would do the same. And we go there on the weekend once they finish baking for the weekend. So Saturday, Sunday afternoons, uh, we would go there with all our ingredients and then they would give us however much time we needed to make our dough and form these loaves. And then the next family would come in and then the next family and so on and so forth. And then all families loaves, they had a little metal, um, little name tag that we would stick at the end. And we still got them. I, I, I remember seeing them at my grandmother's kitchen. And so you could distinguish the different families stolen in the oven. And then they would all get baked at the same time at the bakery. And then we would pick them up and ice them at home. And then they were put in our cool cellar in a massive, really massive uh, wooden wash tub with a lid. And would mature for another two months. The minimum you would want for these is about seven days. But, you know, the longer the better, really, because then all the flavors inside sort of marry together and make the cake rather moist in the middle and it's uh, you know even if even this one here now smelling if if, if you could smell it and um, and then traditionally on the first advent sunday so this year this is actually going to be the last sunday in november because the advent sundays are the last four sundays before christmas and depending on on when christmas falls it could be the first Sunday in December or the last Sunday in November. So traditionally on the first Sunday in uh, before, sorry, in the Advent period, we would start cutting the first cake. And it was it's quite an, an you know an event. You know, we sit down in the afternoon, 3:30 afternoon, have a coffee, or as kids go, like a, a weak coffee, and then we have a slice of this cake and it gets sliced like bread of course my kiwi husband he puts butter on his <laughs> but yeah traditionally you just have this and and we would eat this basically more or less until christmas every afternoon have a slice and it's very high calorie food as you will soon find out it's not something you would want to eat if you're on a diet or indeed now being summer in New Zealand, so in Christmas, um, it's not really a cake for summer, but imagine it's cold in winter, you need all the energy you can get. Cake like this does the trick. A um, couple of things to note before we even start making it. You need a very large bowl that holds this recipe that I'm giving you is for two, sorry, for one kilo of wheat flour and normally we would make them with two kilos and so they would be quite a bit larger but of course you have to alter the recipe so it fits in our modern ovens and it also has some other ingredients that may or may not be able to be purchased within New Zealand you may have to hunt around for them or get them imported like I do normally or, or you just have to go without it and it will alter the taste a little bit. But one of those ingredients is bitter, man, um, bitter almond. So you can get either bitter almond flavoring or actual bitter almonds. I haven't got any actual bitter almonds anymore, but I've got flavoring. And it's a very distinct flavor that you can't really describe that goes into it. And the other one is yeast, fresh yeast. Uh, if you can get your hands on it, I'm lucky. I've, I've ordered some in Christchurch. There is a Mediterranean food company in Christchurch that has fresh yeast and I've got it sent couriered up to me. So I'm using fresh yeast, but you can use dry yeast. Uh, orange peel, if you can make your own lemon peel, that'd be even better. So normally it's a mixture between lemon and orange peel. Raisins, currants, sweet almond flour or meal 
you know, so you can um, peel or you can buy it now these days. You know, it's, I think it's about five, six dollars a, a, a pack, but um, and a lot of butter, a lot. And that is actually because the amount of butter and milk that goes into this cake also made me a winner in a competition with Anchor, believe it or not. So um, it's called Taste taste of home that ended me on TV and so this is actually an award-winning cake believe it or not and I'm an award-winning baker <laughs> um, so hopefully hopefully you like you're able and like to follow this and hopefully your cake will smell as amazing as this one and hopefully taste as good as I remember it from my childhood and adulthood and um, you will need a bit of time because this is a yeast based cake so it takes a little bit of time to mature and to prove in between stages but other than that let's just dive in it so first things first so in this large bowl and I really mean large bowl um, is one kilo 1,000 grams of high-grade wheat flour it, and I've never tried doing this gluten-free so apologies for that but this is the, the recipe my grandmother gave me so a hundred sorry one kilo or two pounds of high-grade wheat flour and into that goes in here I've got half a liter of hand warm milk and 100 grams of fresh yeast and in this jar I've got 200 grams of sugar but I'm not using all of it and I will tell you the rest of the ingredients later and there will be a recipe PDF at the end of the video so don't worry if you don't have all the ingredients quite ready so the first thing you do is make a little hole in the middle of your flour and I'm using one of these plastic spatulas. You can use a wooden spoon or you can use your hand or whatever else you want to use. But I'm using one of these rather cool $2 European style baking spatulas. Right? And then I crumble my yeast into it. Into this little hole. You can also crumble this first into a bowl with a little bit of sugar and make it into a little paste that's another option um, and that's what I write in the recipe as well by the way so you, you're not forced to do it this way I'm just showing you the way I learned but it's not sometimes something that people are used to if you never used yeast before and then I put a little bit of sugar on just to help it grow because yeast is a bug really and then I start pouring in some of the milk and again you can use a spoon you can use the spatula I just find that using your fingers same as in any other yeast cake that I make is easier because you can feel the lumps and I just add in a little bit of flour at the time and make it into a fairly thick kind of paste right in the middle here of this bowl you don't have to add all the milk in at once if you don't want to if you only make it like this that's fine too just don't forget to add it in at the end because you may need it And you can already see, well you probably can't, but I can see it forms bubbles. And that is basically when the yeast activates. Just like brewer's yeast. Right, use a little bit more. And that's all I'm doing at the moment. So there is no, no fancy thing. Right? 
I'll leave it at that, put a little bit of flour on the top just to give it a little bit more food. And then all I do is I put it in a warm place, either in the sunlight, put a towel on top just to keep the um, keep it covered so no you know insects can go in and all that, that sort of thing. Um, if you don't have a sunny spot or hot water cupboard, you can preheat your oven to just about 50 degree, turn it off, and when it's sort of hand warm kind of thing, pop your bowl in and let it sit there for about a half an hour, 40 minutes. And this here in the middle will sort of bubble up and you can, you can see it. And I'll show you in a minute what it looks like so you know what to look out for. Right, so here we go. So this is, it's really funny how it looks. So it's bubbling away and it's gone over the sides of the flower and it's just gone really, um, well, bubbly, really. And so now we have to add all the other ingredients onto it. So I will pop the actual recipe at the end so you don't have to remember all of this right now. But basically here is the rest of my sugar. Remember, it was 200 grams, and also I put in there a little bit of vanilla sugar. So, you know, maybe maybe about 20, 25 grams of vanilla sugar or vanilla essence. Then in here, I've got sweet almonds, about 125 grams of it ground. In here, I've got a mixture of currants and raisins. So there is two, 375 raisins and about 100 grams of currants. And some of those were soaked overnight in rum. So if you, if you do have access to rum, by all means, soak them in rum. And this bowl here is all my orange peel. There's about 150 of it. And I put a little bit of um, vanilla essence and I put my aroma in it. My little bitter almond aroma. And there is also some lemon zest from one lemon in here as well. This is the rest of my milk. And most importantly, over here is 500 grams or one block of unsalted butter liquefied. All of that goes in here and get mixed together. And then it needs to go back into a warm spot and rise. It probably will come up to the side of the bowl at this rate. So, first though, we need to... Slowly get this liquid from the sides here. I normally start with the rest of the milk and this is warmed up again. And you can do this in a food processor if you have a large enough bowl that is. Most people probably won't. You can use your fingers too, I will eventually. And now the other liquid ingredient, which is the butter. All of it. And that's what I mean when I say this is a very, very rich cake. And by the way, I don't normally have a big bowl like this at home. I borrowed this from my husband's work. <laughs> Happens to work in a restaurant, which is really convenient. I made the last one that you saw earlier in the bowl that I had here, and there was a bit of a, of a mesh to keep it all contained without coming to the outside. Now the other dry ingredient I want to put in is the almonds and the sugar. And I put all those sort of chunky bits in last. And ideally what you want to do is you want all ingredients to be room temperature. So if you store your things in the fridge, for example, or in a cool place, take them out before. my hand 
hands. Now, make sure you wash your hands first before you do this. The beauty about all this butter is also it tends not to stick to the side of the bowl. It's a fairly moist cake at this stage, but it needs to have a fair bit of moisture in it so it can rise again. But basically what we're doing is, it's a similar process to bread really, it needs to rise usually twice. Now I put in all those currants and raisins and all my peel. And the smell. If you could smell this, you'd be very happy right now. You want to incorporate all of this nicely, evenly into the dough. Alright, so what I do now is I sprinkle a little bit of flour on the top. And then I pop my towel back over this. If you want, you can make the towel a little bit wet so this doesn't dry out too much. And now I pop it back into a nice, the sun is shining, a nice sunny spot outside. This is a metal bowl, so it will transfer the warmth quite nicely. And it will rise probably to about double this. So I usually let it rise 45 minutes to an hour at the very least. And then all there is to do is form the actual loaf and i show you how to do that then. Rightio, so as you can see this has risen to the right top of the bowl. And basically the same thing what you do with bread. You need to punch it first, or punch it really, um, you need to pull it down and then give it a little bit of a of a squeeze and what I can't show you because I haven't got the space for the camera in the kitchen itself then I form a loaf and then put it on a on a tray with some baking paper if you haven't got baking paper just put some um, butter in and then it goes into an oven of 180 in the middle fan forced for about 15 to 20 minutes and then turn it down to about 160 and bake it for another 45 or so until it's nice and brown depending on your oven you may have to um, play around with those timelines a little bit and I'll show you in a minute also when you put a, a wooden skewer in when you think it's finished and it comes out clean that's when your cake is done but we we'll do this bit first because it's so nice to to watch so basically same as in bread you pop your and deflate it all. And you can see that is the yeast working. It basically made it all fluffy and lovely gooey. Absolutely love this really. And then just give it another good squeeze to incorporate all those raisins and currants and things. And now I form it into a nice solid loaf and I show you and I bring the tray over and I show you the last step before you put it in the oven. Right, so this is my stollen on the baking tray with some baking paper underneath. And now you're wondering why I'm holding a knife. And um, the way I've been taught is what you do next is you just do a little shallow cut right here in the middle. 
Oh, you don't have to. Some people form it so it has that little indentation in the middle. I was told to cut it. And what it does, it, it opens it up a little bit, helps with the baking, and it sort of spreads it out. And as it bakes, it will, you know, spread out a little bit more than this. Unfortunately, um, my oven isn't really even, so it will start to brown on one side and then I have to turn it around to the other. But basically, that's all of this. And now it goes in the oven, as I said before, at 180 for about 15 minutes and then I turn it down to 160. I probably turn the tray as well at the same time until it's nice and golden brown. Radio. So icing. So this is my Stollen. It's gone. It's gone way wider than it should have been. This is the fresh yeast for you. And now what I'm doing is I just this is melted butter. That's about 200 grams worth. I may or I may not melt more. I don't know yet. And then I just use a pastry brush and coat the whole stollen in melted butter. So that's all my butter. And now I just use some caster sugar. You don't have to. But I tend to do that first. Put some of that. And there's a lot of butter, as you can tell. Right. And then, the best part, icing sugar. And use a sip. And then, oh. Right, and so some icing sugar as well. Like a lot. And then you ice the whole cake. Do another round. And then what I normally do is once this settled a little bit, you know, because the butter needs to cool down again, I take it out of here and then I try and ice the sides as well. And so what the butter does, it, it sort of soaks in because it's so liquid and it makes the whole cake really nice and moist. And that's really it. 